What's up, everyone? Ashley here with Cyber Therapy, and we are so glad that you are joining us today. Um, this is the show where we get to peek into the minds of security and tech pros. Uh, to not bros, tech pros. <laughs> Definitely not bros. Um, we're not. We're not inviting tech <laughs> bros to the show. And we get to dig into what a lot of security shows, I think, miss, which is the human side of things. So I'm um, really excited to be hosting the show. This is the first episode that we get to completely start from end to end with our new name. This is my co-host, Tyler. Tyler, you want to say a word? What's up, Ash? How are you? Good to see you again. Okay. Uh, did you have a wonderful weekend? I think we had a quasi long weekend here at Jupiter One. Um, because we technically weren't off, which is kind of a bummer, <laughs> but we were, we, we worked, uh, on MLK day. Yes. Um, did you have a good weekend? Yeah, actually we had some friends fly in cause they, uh, in true fashion, like to go skiing on the MLK weekend. And so they decided to come out to Colorado this time, uh, and ended up crashing with us because they closed the, uh, pass. <laughs> <laughs> to too get up snow? to the mountain Friday night. Yeah, too much snow. So oh, um, they crashed with us, which was fun. We got to hang out with them for a little bit, which was nice. How about you? Um, weekend was relatively uneventful. I bought an Oculus and started to emerge myself in the world of the metaverse, which has got its own little thing uh, for an old guy like me. You know, there's a definitely a steep learning curve there. We can get into that on later shows. But then the other thing is uh, I actually took my son. For those of you who don't know, I have a 17-year-old son and a 14-year-old daughter. I took my 17-year-old son to his first college tour today, which is a bit of a milestone as a father, you know, seeing your boy looking at universities and, and thinking about it. And then you know, he just does something stupid and you realize he's still a child. And, and uh, yeah, and he did. He did something very stupid, of course, and, you know, made my wife laugh and laugh and laugh and embarrass us right in front of the whole uh, the whole tour. But that's what makes a 17 year old boy a boy. So we had a blast with that. But getting nice. old, Ash, I'm getting old. I'm not going to lie. I don't even remember my college tours. So, um, you know, it's funny. I just remember I live... palm trees in L.A. That was about it. <laughs> I grew up in uh, Western New York, in Syracuse, New York, most of my life, born in Buffalo. And I came down and I toured the same university that my son's looking at here in North Carolina. I actually did my tour and I could not remember the tour at all. All I remember is thinking it's too far from home. It's not where I want to go. But it was really interesting to get a tour of a campus. I had been toured 27 years ago. I think it was I had I'd done a tour at that same campus. So anyways, um, we have more important things to talk about than my children. What's what's on tap for today? What's the agenda look like for today's cyber therapy? Yeah, today I am super excited to bring on our guest, Caroline Wong. She is um, just a word of of how I remember meeting her. We were at AppSec. DC. Hang on, I'm gonna, oh, I'm gonna, inter I'm gonna interrupt. Bring her in? Okay, let's, okay. Let's bring her in before okay, we okay. go through the high medicine. I want to see her reaction. Everyone. I want to see her reaction. There, there she is. we go. Welcome to the show, <laughs> Caroline. How are you? I'm great. I'm happy I'm to so be glad here. So real quickly, before Ashley gives the background, I just want to say one thing. She might be the most hugest, insane, crazy super fan on the planet of Caroline Wong. Like, yeah, she's losing <laughs> her stuff all this week. Swear to God. That is so, so cool. Um, I usually tend to dominate these interviews. I have a gut feeling I'm going to be sitting back here, way back here in the corner, just watching. I don't think I'll be involved <laughs> so much. I think it's mostly going to be the Ash show today. But go ahead. Let's hear you. Let's hear how you met her. So first impression keynote at AppSec DC. I'm seeing an Asian American woman up there at a security conference. And so number one, I was like, dude, that's awesome. But also I was like this. I wonder if that could be me someday. So just to say representation matters. Thank you for paving the way. And for like I told my husband the other day, she's. The mentor I wish I had, the sister I had, wish I had, like people who Wait. are paving the way to. Super cool, but I'm I'm your current mentor. <laughs> I know. So, Don't worry. And a compliment to Ash. I'm just saying. <laughs> but it's just so wonderful to be able to see a woman of color in in a place like that, right? Giving a speech, and not only that, starting the whole session with a deep breathing exercise. I thought was just so different and new and good. Like it's about time we start talking about mental health, I think in in industry, not just security, but in your profession in general, like everybody has their stresses and being able to bring your whole self to work means a lot, right? Um, so before I blab too much, uh, that's like, and then 
the third instance was, I think it was probably after your keynote. We were going back to the rooms or whatnot. And uh, <laughs> this is such like a starstruck moment because I was like, hey, where did you just do the keynote? And you're like, uh-huh. But I think you were like in the zone or something like that. And I was like, I have no idea what to say to her. Like, <laughs> should I ask her Should I, something? Should I call? I, I don't know what to say. So it was a qui very quiet elevator ride back up to the room. <laughs> so, yes. So that's my first meeting with Caroline Wong. I was starstruck, but also very in awe and, and very excited to hear from you. So I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Oh, well, I'm just thrilled. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah. If you don't mind, do you mind giving us a little bit of a background of how you got to where you are today? TLDR on your life, whatever you want to include in that career, I, et cetera. I would be thrilled. I would be thrilled to share that. So I grew up in San Francisco, daughter of Chinese immigrants. When I was six years old, there was a big earthquake in San Francisco. There was also the world's first ever ransomware attack in 1989. Ooh. We'll get to why that's relevant in a future question. Um, <laughs> when I was 16 years old, getting ready to go to college, my Chinese immigrant father said to me, Caroline, what do you want to study in school? And I said, I would love to study dance or psychology. And he said, you're going to study engineering and you're going to do it at the best school that you can get accepted to. And so I went to UC Berkeley and I studied electrical engineering and computer science. It was hard. Um, in between my junior and senior year, I thought to myself, the thing that one does at this stage is to get an internship. I wanted to spend that summer in Silicon Valley with my boyfriend at the Times family and not with my family in San Francisco. So I applied to internships in Silicon Valley instead of in San Francisco. <laughs> and I got a gig at eBay as a project manager. Uh, I basically made eBay's at the time, you know, this is like summer of 2004 our business continuity and disaster recovery, basically like intranet web page. That was my internship project. That, and when I- That's such a cool internship. How, how old are you when you landed that roughly? Like, like 17, like how old are you when you're a junior in college? However old, like, maybe 19, like 19, maybe 19, something 19. like that. I also won a pie eating contest that summer. <laughs> Very proud of that. Need to dig up that photo somewhere. Um, and what that kind of was- pie? Cherry if you don't mind me asking. Cherry pie. Oh, and do you still but I love eat all the pies today? I love all the pies. I actually, like, don't eat sugar for the most part these oh, days, okay. but I can still appreciate a good cherry pie. And then I'll just eat, like, ribeye and bacon while I, <laughs> like, eyeball feast on someone else's cherry pie. Um, yeah. So I graduate from college, and I'm so glad to be done with college because for me, college was very hard because Eeks at Berkeley is very hard. And yes. I contact my internship manager and I say, hey, uh, I'd really like to work for you full time. And he says, well, the IT department has a hiring freeze, so we can't hire you. And he says, Ooh. but there is an entry level position on the information security team. And I said, I don't know, like I've never heard those two words used together before. And he was like, yeah. it's okay. I think you should apply. You know, they're looking for a new college grad. You know, the expectation, you know, you'll basically learn on the job. And this was 2005. So, you know, 2002, SOCs became a thing for public companies. 2004, the first version of PCI DSS came out. And I started my cybersecurity career at eBay. Wow. That's amazing. That was the start. Yeah. Do you remember, just real, real quickly, this might be a diversion. It's probably completely worthless because I'm good at these. Who Do you remember who the CISO was at eBay at the time? So we had Dave Colonnay. In fact, I later wrote a book on security metrics. Wait, 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 wait. Oh, oh, this is going to be fun and really weird. Super fun and weird. Oh, I have it back there. Uh, fun and weird. And this book is dedicated to Dave Colonnay, who... Oh taught me everything that I know. This book is dedicated to Dave Cullinane. Thank you for teaching me. I guarantee, I guarantee that we ran in some of the same circles back in 2005. I was a pen tester at a company called At Stake, and we did a ton of work with, with eBay back in that era. That so I'm sure sense. we bumped into each other 
way, way back then. But uh, I don't have quite the introduction story that Ashley does. I can't remember the moment I met you. I feel like I've just known you forever. I feel like I've known you forever. The thing that stands out to me is that Tyler got a job that I really wanted. I really wanted this job at Forrester. And they were like, well, like, you're pretty good. But there's this other guy, person, you know, whatever, gender nonspecific at the time. And then later, so you got that job and I go off to work for Sigital. And I saw you that year at RSA and I was like, dude, how's it going? And you were like, I am on my like 45th meeting today. And I was like, this sucks. Dude, <laughs> like my job is way funner. Than I, felt, I remember that. Now that is how I met you. I forgot all about that. It was yeah. like in front of the Western St. Francis. And I was like, I, oh my gosh, I Tyler Shields. That. Like, how's it going at Forrester? And you yep. were like, this is a lot. I remember that moment now too. And I remember thinking maybe I, maybe I should have passed. <laughs> <laughs> Because what they do for the for those that are on the stream that don't know this, I was an anal- analyst at Forrester for four years. And to be totally honest, I'm kind of half joking here, but to be totally honest, it was one of the career defining uh, positions for me. I really thoroughly enjoyed it. And if you ever do get the chance to become an analyst, I highly recommend it. But the worst part about being an analyst pre-COVID, I don't know how it is post-COVID, but pre-COVID was going to RSA and going to Black Hat. They literally, you would have... 30, 40 plus meetings in a day, like just you 15, 17 hours straight of back to back 30 minute meetings with every company you can imagine. And at the end of it, you're like, I, I remember nothing of the day. <laughs> so what was the point of it? But anyway, so so you're at eBay. Let me hear let me hear the rest of that TLDR. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So work at eBay, work with Dave Cullinane. Dave says to eBay's executive team, we need a much, much, much larger security budget. They give him the money. He turns to me as the team's chief of staff and says, well, I guess we're growing the team from 25 to 64. I guess we're doing all these projects. We're buying all this tech. Six months later, he says to me, now that we have the money and the people and the projects, we need the metrics to show the value of the program and to ensure a recurring investment. We need to help people understand this is not just a one time spent. And so he said to me, go and figure that out. And I went and I talked to Andy Jaquith and I talked to Dan Gear and I said, like, how do you do this? Um, And we figured it out. Um, It was it was so fun. Uh, And then there was I knew we ran in the same circles. Andy J and Dan Gear were both at at stake with me. Oh, just. Just some of the best humans. Good, good on this people, planet. for sure. Really, good really people. wonderful, good people. Dan Gear, I have somewhere um, a like printed off at FedEx or something, uh, like bound uh, hard copy draft of this book uh, with Dan Gear's notes all he, over it. He is one of the most influ- influential security leaders, I think, in history. Like, if you were to write, like, you know, a dozen of the most influential security leaders. You got, you know, some of the old, old school guys that wrote protocols that did the hardcore stuff. And you got Dan. Like Dan is of that caliber, should be in the Security Hall of Fame, in my opinion. So smart. So smart. So hung out at eBay, met a lot of super smart, super cool people. And then there was this thing that happened on Facebook and it was called Farmville. And then... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> the company that made Farmville had all these security incidents. And so they decided to build a security team. And I thought to myself, I have been commuting from San Francisco to San Jose for five years. I would really like to have a shorter commute. I will drive to Potrero Hill. Um, and I wrote the information security policies to take Zynga public. Um, And then I transferred over to the vendor side. So went from eBay to Zynga to Symantec, did some global global product management, tried to get a job at Forrester that Tyler got instead of me, and then went to Sigital where was so later, too. later they got uh, they got acquired by Synopsys. When I was there, it was still called Sigital. Uh, I did BSIM assessments. I did three dozen BSIM assessments, and I was horrified <laughs> to discover, like, because my work it was so fun. This this for me was like before I had kids. Now I have two young children, and I'm so glad to be able to spend a lot of time with them. Before I had kids, it was like. 
today we're going to be in Sweden and tomorrow we're going to be in Japan. And this is like so awesome, you know, and I'm just you, meeting people. Did you ever get burned out on the, on the, 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 the travel, the constant pressure of oh, that research lifestyle? It. I See, I got burned it. out. I got burned I did out it, hard. I did it for the right amount of time. I did it for the right uh, amount of time. I only did it for three years. I uh, think if I had done okay. it for longer, then it would have gotten to me. But for three years, it was like, now, as a as a parent of young children in pandemic era, I'm like oh, a hotel and like a Ritz Carlton breakfast buffet that sounds and so an good right airplane. Now. You're not wrong. You know what I mean, right? So I have this way in which, at the time, it was awesome, and now I'm like, oh my gosh, like what a fantasy dream to be living that life. <laughs> and um, yeah, so I flew around the world. I talked to people about how they built their software, and I found out. That so here's the thing about BSIM. It is like a great data pool. It's also a skewed and a biased data pool because it costs money to get a BSIM and to get in the data pool. So if you're getting a BSIM done, you're probably kind of good at software security, or at least not really, really, really horrible. Um, and all of these companies, your average company that might do a BSIM has a thousand applications. And they only pen test 100 of them, uh, like yeah. ever. Yeah. And that we, is We We put terrifying. out a, a blog post. It is terrifying. We put out a blog post here at Jupiter One recently, last year, I believe, um, about sampling versus complete analysis, which is, I think, plays right into your wheelhouse and some of the work that you're currently doing as well on top of the metrics, Correct. 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 So As a I, fact, I think you came out with a book, right? <gasps> I did. When, when, yeah. when did you release? When, when was there is, a book. Are we this announcing book, it here? We could announce it here. I feel like there was a soft launch last week. I actually have not received my personal hard copy versions yet. Well, we're gonna, I'm going to be like this. Does, hey, this is the book right here. This is the copy of the book. It, they're, <laughs> like, they're like in the mail on their way, but there is an ebook version available. I wrote the book on PTAS, the PTAS book. It is filled with XKCD inspired comic strips. Oh my gosh. <laughs> Sign me up. Actually, oh so I, I, I have to admit, I'm completely lucky to have this role as a co host here on the show because um, Cobalt has graciously promised to send me one. So I will have Yay. it as soon as I get it, as soon as I get the hard copy, it will be presented right here alongside the Jupiter One Modern <laughs> Cybersecurity book. Your security metrics book, uh, the new P-Test book, and then Jupiter One has a couple additional books coming out in 2022, which will also end up being displayed here on the bookshelf. But um, real real quickly, um, kind of tell us a little bit about the P-Test book, the content, what the thought is behind it, the 30,000-foot the view of, of where that comes from. Cool. So tech used to be like manage your own infrastructure on premise in a private data center. And now everything's like the cloud and pen testing used to be, you know, you had two options. You could either build an internal pen test team, which is hard to do, even harder to retain, or you could call up your local consulting firm and say, Hey, I need a pen test project. And then super smart, capable folks like Tyler would be signed up for like 50 projects in the queue before they could get to you. And then six weeks later, you know, you get to start. Um, so what we're doing is we're saying, look, modern software development happens really fast and manual pen testing is super important. So we have developed a way to get manual pen tests started in 24 hours in order oh. to support oh. modern software development. So every request for a pen test that goes through this program, and it's done through Cobalt, correct? So, yes. But let's be totally clear, because I'm not a marketing person. The majority of them do actually get scheduled like a week in advance. Sure, sure. If, if, if I can give you a notice, have... I'm going to give you the notice. Right, right. But if you need it, and if you have bought Cobalt credits, so we have these like video <laughs> arcade token style. Because right. if I come to you and I say, hey... What's your application portfolio look like? How much pen testing do you think you'll do? Then you can make an estimate, but you probably don't know exactly, and that's fine. 
You just buy basically a bucket of tokens. And then when you need a pen test, you call us up and you say, hey, Caroline, can I turn in my token for a pen test? And I say, yeah. And then we'll get it started. Gotcha. So I want to double click on that. I have a question because we started this conversation a little bit around uh, continuous testing versus sampling. Yeah. And so by doing this and having PTES, pen testing as a service, do I get closer or even complete the vision of continuous testing? Can I get there? I think it's possible. We have organizations who, so the other thing about the token thing in our assification of pen testing. <laughs> that might be the word of the day right there, folks. You heard it here, Caroline Wong. Term, uh, the term of the day, assification. <laughs> not only do you get to turn in your tokens and get your pen test right away, but you can also say, I want, like a three token size pen test. I want a five token size pen test. I want a 10 token sized pen test. And so uh, we have organizations that will, for example, you know, for their flagship products, they'll do like four big pen tests a year, but they'll do like eight small pen tests like once every month in yeah. between sort of thing. Um, and so continuous is a super interesting word. For me, it's not so much the continuous meaning like there's never a break to me it's just like how fast is your software changing and then is your security mm -hmm. testing keeping up yeah yeah no it's that's super interesting back when i was a pen tester uh, way back in my youth 20 years ago um it was exactly we we always used to make the joke every every project was Two, two consultants, two weeks, two guys, two weeks was the was the joke, right? Literally every product, didn't matter how big. And the reason we could make that joke, and it kind of gets to your point, is something I call the, the asymmetry of time when it comes to pen testing. And I've written, I've written on this publicly before. Hackers have the luxury of infinite time. Pen testers do not. Pen testers are time bound, right? Whether it's a small token, a medium token, or a large token, we're time bound. So we don't have the luxury of infinite time. And because of that, there's an asymmetry. And that puts the attackers, when it comes to pen testing, in a position of power because they can keep going forever and ever and ever. And so I think the closer we can get to kind of making sure that any time a tweak or change occurs, using that small coin to test it continuously every time something new is there, and we'll call it quasi-continuously, right? Not, not like full-time scanning constant, but quasi-continuously. New push, you know, once a week, you know, every time a push occurs, let's get that small token in play that decreases that asymmetry of time, right? So that's why I find this to be a super interesting offering. We're pumped about it, you know? And, and as I mentioned, when I was six years old, the first ransomware attack occurred. This was in 1989. You can do the math. It's fine. I'll be 39 this year. It's two, two, <laughs> 2,000 weeks. I read this book. I read this book, um, 4,000 weeks, highly recommend. Um, and then I did the math and I was like, oh, this year, I will actually pass my 2,000 week mark. The whole point of the book is to say, hey, you've only got 4,000 weeks. Like You should be super purposeful about how you use them. And if I'm going to be super purposeful about how I use my remaining 2,000 weeks, I want to make a difference in this industry. And if I look at the OWASP top 10 that came out in 2021, and I compare that to the OWASP top 10 that came out in 20, 2003. In 2003, I was like a junior in college. I also want to just briefly state how long time passes between 2003 and 2021. In 2003, Matthew McConaughey was in How to Lose a Guy in 10 Days. <laughs> yes, in 2021, Matthew McConaughey was the koala in Sing 2. This is how much time has passed. <laughs> and if you put oh the 2003 God. and the 2021 OWASP top 10 right next to each other, it's the same. And 100%. That, you can... And that is horrifying yeah no you what, can overlay what has that our too. life's work been yeah you can well, overlay where's that, the impact that same analogy overlay with keanu matrix or keanu reeves original <laughs> matrix keanu reeves revolutions or resurrections or whatever the, the latest one's called there you go Dude Hot aged movies, a lot OWASP hasn't changed at all and it's <laughs> because same. it's because in my personal opinion it's not the technical problems that are the hardest to solve. We as an industry know how to find and how to fix and how to prevent application security vulnerabilities. What we don't know is how to work with each other to get the darn things fixed or to do the basic hygiene 
like last year, Colonial Pipeline, JBS, you know, every every media interview I have is like, oh, what do you think about ransomware? What's going to happen? Did they pay in Bitcoin? And it's like, if you just patched your vulnerabilities and tested your backups, it would not work. I have a there rant. are basic things. Please bring I, on the I rant. Have a rant. Ransomware is not a thing. It's an unpopular opinion. I don't believe that ransomware is a thing. I think ransomware is an outcome of a bunch of problems, right? So ransomware is a thing only in the sense that it's the result of the other problems you have. So this whole storyline that that marketers, cyber marketers put out there about we solve ransomware, you, you can't solve ransomware. Ransomware is the outcome of a bunch of vulnerabilities. Is is something else. You got popped with a phishing attack. You got popped with something, an S3 bucket wide open. Like you can't solve ransomware. You can solve the security problems that lead to ransomware. But anyways, that's my rant. I'm going to take a second here because I don't want to go down the ransomware hole, rat hole. Literally, I don't want to go down that. Totally but. not necessary. <laughs> totally not necessary. <laughs> Just I want illustrative. To transition because I promised I would sit back and let Ashley fangirl because she has some really, really phenomenal questions for you. I want to, to kick it to Ashley to ask some of the questions that we have queued up around culture, around you know your your transformation of security culture over the years advice for other leaders ashley just has an amazing you know wonderful number of questions here so ash hit one yeah i mean going back to what you said how, how we have a hard time working with each other you wrote a piece in forbes i think last year around different types of security cultures which i thought was really intriguing to me because I never, I guess I don't really think about team cultures as being able to be segmented that way. So do you mind just sharing a little bit about the those types of cultures? I would be thrilled to. So I read a book and it is called Sapiens. And what the author of this book says is that when you get humans together, then they can influence each other's behavior via one-to-one -one relationships. The three of us here, each of us between each other has a one-to-one -one relationship, and there's a level of influence that we can have on each other's behavior. When, when the group of humans gets to be more than 100, then cultural rules start to play a really big role. If you want to influence the behavior of like bunches of people, then it goes beyond one-to-one -one relationships, and it gets into mm -hmm. things like religion and philosophy and like cultural practices and there's like maybe a difference between what you say and what you do and security i think is highly cultural it has everything to do with how does the ceo treat the head of security does the ceo respect the head of security does the ceo listen to the head of security. And if you're on that security team, you could be the world's most extraordinary security professional. But if your company's, if the head of your company does not respect or listen to the security function, then there's, I think there's very little that you can do to influence change in an environment like that. Yeah, I agree completely. And, and, you know, like I said, I got burned out on my tech side of my career partway through the career and switched over to a business career. And that's how I became kind of this accidental CMO role, right? It was never an intentional direction for me. But one thing I did learn, I went back to school for a business degree and, and had a lot of experience on the business side. It equates exactly to building a business and how to build the culture of a business is very similar to the process of building a cybersecurity culture. It comes from the ingrained practices, the leader, the top-down vision, and being able to enable people to get done what they need to get done, right? To do their jobs. And without that level of cultural impact from throughout the organization, the organization won't thrive. The business won't thrive. It's the exact same thing with cybersecurity. Totally agree. We, uh, you know, you and I, it's so interesting, Tyler, that you and I, we've had these like, almost like side by side career chapters, right? Like, you got the job that I wanted and like, now you're a CMO. Now I'm a CSO for strategy. I joined this company when it was 10 people and we are like series B. We're more than 200 people around the world. Uh, you know, we're growing like wild. That That's amazing. It's so Ten fun. People. It's so fun. <laughs> and so there is a super interesting cultural aspect because mm -hmm. when you join a, when you join a company of 10 people, there is a culture there mm -hmm. and it just, it just is. 
But when the company grows to 40 and 50 and beyond, then you have to be intentional. And what we did yep. was we were, this was like pre pandemic time when you could like safely and easily get together in person. You know, it is whatever, 2018, 2019, we're in Miami and Jacob Hansen says to everyone, let's all stand in a circle. And one by one, he calls up like a dozen of our team members and he says, this is Julie Kurt. And I think Julie is extraordinary. She takes full accountability. She will do anything it takes to get something done. And he just talks about what it's like working with her. And then he invites everyone else to chime in. And meanwhile, I am like in the corner on a laptop, like frantically typing away. And we have this spreadsheet. We have this beautiful artifact of the dozen or so folks that Jacob named at the time and all of the different uh, descriptive, uh, you know, things that people said about them. Mm -hmm. And that is how we came up with the cobalt values. We came up with them by looking at each other and describing what we saw. Uh, and so now, you know, even though we do it virtually every, uh, twice every year, we get the whole company together. Our kickoff is actually next week and we have cobalt value awards. And so for each value, we've got these four values. We nominate two people and we award them and we do a similar thing. And we say like, Hey, you know, for the Humble Learning Award, it's Ashley. And then like, you know, Ashley, come on, get up on this virtual stage. And then everyone just like stands up and talks about like why they love working with you. And in this way, we like to think that our values are not sort of just like something on a poster. And they're office. not forced. Right. I they're, think they're what, organic I, too. what I love about that is your leadership normalized that, right? Like you made it, you led by example, which I thought was, is just so interesting because I think in a lot, like along the lines of wanting to make most of, you know, the 2000, uh, what, weeks. 2000, 2000 weeks that weeks. you have left. Yes. Um, like I want to know that I made a difference too. Right. And wherever we go, right. In whatever circles yeah. that you end up in, when you're in a culture that you recognize needs to have some change, right? Like this is something that you grew from the ground up, right? But let's yeah. say there's some people in this or on the live stream that maybe they're in organizations where they recognize the culture needs to change, but they're not sure like how how to go about it, right? Because, yep. you know, they're one person in a sea of people. Like how would you encourage them or advise them to go about kind of leading the way too yes. in that aspect? So there is a way in which I think politics is a real thing and it is to each of our advantages to acknowledge that. So I think that it's important to look at your organization and understand beyond the formal org chart, who actually has power in that organization? Who actually makes decisions? How does behavior actually get influenced? And if it's in the direction that you wanna go, or if you can identify champions like find champions and all go at it together, right? That's, uh, mm -hmm. there's, this, there's this book called The Unicorn Project, right? This is what happens mm -hmm. in The Unicorn Project. If you don't, it is hard, unfortunately, to mm -hmm. be one person in a sea of people when the tide is going one way and you're going the other. And if that's the case, my advice to you is to get a new job. <laughs> and for the folks who are with us today on the live stream, we are, we're a very privileged group of people. Those of us who have skills in information security are fairly marketable. There are relatively a lot of jobs available to us. We, some of us have the opportunity to work from home or wherever we have a strong internet connection. Um, and so there are other jobs, you know. Um, I advocate for leaving your job if you do not feel like you are ever going to be able to have the impact that you want to have because i think there's so that, another place out yeah. there for you where you can go find it yes um having gone through process like that of feeling like i don't have a voice but learning how to find a voice not and here. moving places not here, right no 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 not here. definitely not here <laughs> but clearly right like literally your voice like yeah, literally, literally this, this, this is literally your i voice. actually more often than not have trouble stopping Ashley's voice. It's kind of a pain in the ass. Thank to be goodness with you. for that. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I disagree with him a lot, especially in front of people. And I wonder but, sometimes if that actually makes you. I want to get. I want to get back to your to your to your line, Ashley, because I don't want to lose that that story you're about to tell. But quite frankly, it's it's also a matter of encouraging others, right? So I think there's a a, a team aspect to it too. When you're not in the right spot with the right team with the right people, you might feel stifled, right, mm -hmm. Ashley? I mean, I think that's kind of the point of your story. Go ahead and finish it. But, you know, if you get the right team, the right people around you, it becomes easier. Yep. I would agree with that. I also wanted to toss the question of, all right, let's just say you're burnt out. You are extremely, you know, your morale is not great right now. You recognize that you need to make a change. Where do you start? Is it an internal start of figuring out what do I want and, you know, what are the aspects of what I want to look for? Or is it more of a let's just make this happen and get out and then we'll figure it out later like what would you recommend so i do have advice and my advice comes from me having lived life experiences where sometimes things get real bad sometimes people are mean and sometimes unfair stuff happens. And sometimes people that you love get sick and die. Like sometimes bad stuff happens. And sometimes the first thing you need is just a break. Like there is a time for like big warrior fighting change. And there is a time for rest. Mm -hmm. And if you are severely burnt out and exhausted, the first thing to do probably is to find some rest. And if it's possible... Maybe what you do is you just chill out in your current job, you try to emotionally detach, and you just rest, and you just eat nutritious food, and you try to sleep if you can, and you find out the things that bring you joy, and you do those things. And then when you're a little stronger, when you've hibernated, then it's time to apply to each and every single job that you could possibly be qualified for. And, you know, one of the cool things about this industry is there's all these like groups of people like join a group and 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 if you find someone that you like become friends with them and text them every day about what's going on <laughs> in your life it does not have to be your coworker who doesn't respect or listen to you like there are communities in infosec that you can join and that you can tap into and there are wonderful people to connect with and you can leverage that energy and then go and find your next thing and where yeah. people will appreciate what you bring to the table. Yeah, I, I totally, totally agree. I mean, I've gone through similar experiences and it, this, the thing to understand too, is the, the job you're in may not be a bad job. The people may not be bad people. It just may not work for you anymore. Right. And so I've made decisions in my career, similar, you know, Hey, I'm not being fulfilled in the position I'm at. I'm not gaining traction. I'm not making forward momentum. And I've taken the ball and said, I'm going to handle this. I'm going to take care of this. And for me, both times that I ran into that situation was going back for additional education, formal education. That's a work for me that may or may not work for other people. And like Caroline said, you know, I want the audience to understand for me, it was education for others. It might be connecting to a new tribe for others. It might be self teaching a new project for mm -hmm. others. It might be a, a, a hobby, like picking up music. I didn't start music till I was 35. I needed it when I was an analyst as a distraction from the grind of being an analyst. And so I, I love that concept of looking for whatever re-energizes you after your break, right? Take that time, take the self-care time and then figure out what's going to, what's going to make you whole again. Right. So I, I love that thought process. I have two streams of thought. One, I wanted to circle back to uh, Caroline, what you said about apply what you believe you are um, qualified for. And I just want to hone in on that for a second because I, I it kind of rubs me a little bit the wrong way, to be quite honest, because I feel like, okay, my sister-in-law, she got her PhD um, in communications at Ohio State, and she was telling me... Um, when I was going through this process of figuring out what my next step was. In one of the studies she, she read, um, women tend to uh, interview for jobs that they fulfill a lot of the qualifications for already and they feel like yep, they yep, can yep. do it versus men tend to be look at a list of qualifications and say, oh, I can do those things and I'll just speak to it, right? So in the realm of 
applying for things that you are qualified for, right? Especially in a time where women only make up 25% of the workforce, which is albeit better than how it was, what, 10 years ago, right? True, true. How do we, how, how do you qualify qualified, I guess? Yeah, is, is no, that's a super good clarification. And actually, my intention was to convey like apply to a lot of things mm. like it's it's a, a little bit ironic and I can absolutely see how that was received um but my intention was actually to say apply to everything 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 because the whole looking for a new job thing is also super hard Mm -hmm. uh, that's one of the reasons why if you're going to do it you should probably just rest first and rebuild your energy and you know 4,000 weeks 2,000 weeks there's another thing that I believe which is that on some level time is a construct and what I think is sometimes more important than time is actually energy and that we can actually we can cultivate our energy and sometimes we can feel like the time that we have is infinite or that we're stopping time. You know, the, these, so much of this Getting is like, state of what? Flow. yeah, Oftentimes absolutely. This like flow thing is real. Time. Yes, yes, absolutely. And real. so, and so it, there's also a connection with Tyler's story. A lot of folks will ask me, Caroline, I want to get into cybersecurity. Which certification should I get? And I will say to them, I don't know. But if you go onto LinkedIn, if you go on to monster.com, I don't even know, like what are greenhouse.io, like pick your, like what's, like I haven't looked for a job for six years, so I don't know. But like whatever <laughs> place you go to look for new jobs, like type in your search field, right? Maybe it's information mm -hmm. security associate or information security engineer, like whatever it is. And look at what they're asking for and then go get that <laughs> because the market will tell you what they want you to have. Um, mm -hmm. way more than, than, than I could tell you. Um, but I also, I, and I think that, you know, there is a whole another path that we could go down with regards to information security, job descriptions and recruiting and like all of <laughs> yes. the opportunities for improvement. So, um, so I, I have a, I have a follow on question here and actually I'm probably going to blow out your agenda for the rest of this. That's okay. So this entire you, conversation kind of went wheelie round. So we have a hard stop. Button. Watch the timer at the top. We got a hard stop yes. at the 60 minute mark. So make sure you, you, you pull us you. in at the right time. Um, yes. One thing that's worked for me and I'd love your opinion on this, Caroline is, I 100% said I'm an accidental CMO. I was an accidental secure. Well, I wasn't really, but I kind of was an accidental security you were guy definitely in my security story. Nerd. But my point is, I never like when I started as security. Security wasn't a thing. Like it didn't mm -hmm. exist, right? Because I'm that old. You're a pioneer. But well, I guess something <laughs> like that. Um, yeah. But for me, what always worked for me, and what I tell my son who's 17, and what I what I, advice I give to young people is, find what you're passionate about and do it live it, be it. And it, the job will come. The job will come. Right. And so maybe I'm wrong in that. And I would love to be counterpointed. My, if you counterpoint my that, experience but. is completely the opposite, which is simply to say that beyond knowing that I wanted to study dance and psychology in school, I never had any idea what I wanted to do. And I always just was like, oh, like this summer, I want to live with my boyfriend's parents instead of with my parents. So I so guess maybe you're more, maybe you're more I'm very opportunistic. <laughs> very, very, there you go. Maybe, but just for different reasons, right? Yeah. In contrast, my sister it is a pediatrician. So when you want to be a pediatrician, you have to like go make a it. goal, do a million predefined steps, you know, and then do that. And I've always just been like, like, what's ahead of me? And is this fun? And can I work really hard and try and make an impact? And like, what's next? And I think the thing about, because my kids are, my kids are like little. When I think about my daughter, and what it's going to be like when she's 17, like, I have no idea what the world is going to be like. But when if she's she has 17. a passion, like, let's say she is passionate about automobiles and being she, a mechanic. She, she happens to love video games. So there's okay. video games, right? Well, I mean, I was passionate about hacking things. I was the kid in, in middle school hacking the local university, right? I was that guy. I was always passionate. And then when I stopped ceased being passionate about the pure bits and bytes about writing assembly and trying to learn that and writing root kits and learning that. And I got burned out on it. My passion switched, my passion switched to building businesses. Mm -hmm. And so the second half of my career has been following that passion. 
And it's, it, it, it really hasn't been like, oh, I want to be this in business. It's I'm enjoying this. I want to work at what I'm enjoying doing and following my passion has gotten me where I've gotten. Does that resonate with you at all? I don't think it's yes, necessarily there is a thing, to what you're saying. Yes, there is a thing about self-awareness because what I did, I was living this like what now feels like a fantasy, you know, jet setting consultant lifestyle. And then I had a kid and I looked for a local job. And at the time I was the sole breadwinner for a home, for a family that was paying for a San Francisco mortgage with a young child. For me to make the decision to go and choose to join a pre-series A 10-person startup, that was a risk. That was (laughs) a risk. And what resonates in me that I'm hearing from you, Tyler, is your own self-awareness about what lights you up. And what I saw... I was like, something about this lights me up. And I remember going to one of my interviews. I had dinner with two of the founders and I come home from that interview and my husband's been taking care of our, you know, one-year-old who at that time is like exclusively breastfed. I mean, it was complicated. Super hard. Yeah. And I walk in and I am glowing so much. He says to me, Caroline, you have to take this job. You can't let this opportunity pass you by because I've never seen you this excited about work. And that- And then when you have it, off you go. Off you You're go. passionate. Off you go. Yes. Yes. And 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 for me, the passion has been this mesh of I'm passionate about my colleagues whom I have come to know and care about. And I want us all to be wildly successful. And I'm passionate about this industry. I've spent my entire career in this industry and we have like some change. And I'm like, can we get some step change, please? (laughs) You know? And so like, why not try to build a company that enables that step change? Mm -hmm. And that's, and that, that is the passion. I love it. All right. um, I'm going to pivot us into the game so that we can get some game time in before we're going to have to wrap. So, so real quick. So for those that are new to the stream, yes, for those that are new to the stream, we always try to do a fun game at the end. And so mm-hmm. something unique, something different. Sometimes we repeat games just because we're not super creative and we can't come up with brilliant ideas every time. <laughs> but in general, uh, we we try to do uh, an interesting game. So if you want to see the game, smash the like. What, what, do the, what do the kids say, Ash? Smash the yeah, like. Smash that the subscribe, subscribe button. Yes. Bang that subscribe follow button. Follow our company on LinkedIn. Follow us on YouTube. Do Twitch, all those. Follow Twitter, and, and all the things. things. Yeah, yes. do all that. All right, now, yeah. Ash, what's the game? Get in our marketing funnel. <laughs> <laughs> that too, that too. But however, you won't get there by smashing like and follow and subscribe. So yes, go ahead and do worry. those We won't now. spam you that way. <laughs> all right, Um, this is called the Eight Second Descriptions, and it is inspired by Jimmy Fallon's Five Second Summaries, where he had... So here's how the game's going to work. Okay. Um, you, We all know we love our acronyms in this day and age, not just in tech, but also just in general, right? Gen Zers love their their, uh, acronyms in text messages and whatnot. So so this is a game around those acronyms. Cool. One person is gonna close their eyes because I'm gonna have to put the actual acronym up there and what it stands for. Um, The other person who doesn't have their eyes closed is gonna have eight seconds. Eight seconds to describe that acronym without using any of the words that are part of the acronym. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. This is going to be fun. Let's do this. All right, Tyler, you're going to. Do you want me to be the uh, the the receiver? Or the. I I can put my blindfold. We we could do like back and forth. Yeah. Okay. We'll switch. All right. All right. Close your eyes. (laughs) Okay. Oh, my goodness. We'll start with a simple one. Okay. Ready? Yeah. Okay. And Okay, so remember how I made that joke about acidification? Yes. So there's this acronym and it's about that. Software as a service. Bam. Yeah, good job. Ding 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 ding. Very nice, very nice. All right. Uh shall we switch? Okay. Okay. You ready? All right, bring it up. Let's go. This is when you try to log in and your phone Makes you use Duo. Oh, SSO. No. Uh, come on, three, two, one. Uh, uh, MFA. 
Yo, she got it. <laughs> you got it with like Very one nice. second left. I, I'm the zero. Oops. Oh, your timer's still running. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. All right. right. So I, think I didn't realize let's... this was timed because I had my 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 thing cover my eyes. <laughs> okay. Yes. All right, ready? Uh, Go ahead. So to be clear, you don't have to guess it within the time. You just have to stop describing it when the time's up. Oh, okay. Okay. Cool. Okay. So, okay, we're gonna go actually a little bit more challenging now. We're gonna go five seconds because I think ah! you guys have, have this going on. All right. Uh we'll do this one. Oh, so what is one of the things that used to be on the OAS top ten but is no longer? Oh my god. I don't have to <laughs> memorize that. It's one of those like three letter ones that like was very straightforward. Like what did you find all the time in two thousand one? XSS. Yes. Yeah. Good job. Good job. Good job. Woo! So, so that was like story. a super nerdy one. Well, not only was it super nerdy, but the, the running joke inside of, of when I was on pen test teams back in the early 2000s was the all of the, the newbies and the younger pen testers found all the excess. We always are like, oh, you're the XSS king this week. You got all those. You take all those. And the smart guys would all go look for like the logic flaws and the, the super complex stuff. Okay. We are a good team. Uh, High five. Yes. That, we that go. was good. That was good. All right. All right. Here we go. All right. Here we go. Um, this is gonna test your gen your your self proclaimed Gen Z ness, Tyler. Oh God, I don't have any of that. <laughs> <laughs> All right, ready? Oh, um, oh my God, um, not cyber, but it is like meat space. What the? F <laughs> <laughs> oh, uh, wait, hold on, meat space. Three letter meat space. space. Three letters meat space. <laughs> oh, I. Definitely have no idea what I'm talking about. Am I supposed to stop about. when the timer's done? Am I yes, okay. technically, yes. All right, that's so okay. that's the end of my description. You got to come up with meat it. Three space. Proud cow. <laughs> Farm no. foods. No, meat space, human human space, not cyberspace. You are. Oh, uh, like metaverse? That's no. not a thing. That's not an acronym. I can't think Other of... way. It's oh. a, th a three-letter acronym that is typically Not used... the metaverse, but, you know. Like... XXE. CSF. Walking, walking. I'm walking around <laughs> in my house. I am. FYI. <laughs> oh, in real. IRL, IRL, yes! IRL. Yay! Yes. Got it. <laughs> yes. That was a hard one. That was How a hard one. That's a hard one. How do IRL? hard one to describe. That was really good. That's we a did tough it. Okay. We did it. Okay. Let's we had do to just want one meander more round. Before we got there. One yes, more? One more round. This, is, this time we're going to try and do it in one second. Oh, come on. Okay, fine. Three seconds. I've got it. There's, let's Three do this. Seconds. We've got okay. this. Oh, gosh. This is like a sports thing. Uh, but then it's, yeah, that, that's all I have. A sports thing. It's, I don't even know. I, I don't know if it's a sport. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, that would be logical Is it a sports thing? I feel like it's a sports thing. Anyway, good luck. Uh, Tom, Brady. Give me <laughs> Tom Brady is a QB. No. Are you great? Tom Brady is. Yeah. The what does that stand for? G O A T, greatest of all time. Yeah. But you do know I hate Tom Brady. Like, I despise, <laughs> I despise Tom Brady. Do I don't not know ever any use of that analogy sports. with me again. I don't even, I'm not even sure what sport that man plays. He plays, he plays sports. So oh, well. I just can't stand Tom Brady. Anybody but Tom Brady. Come on. I feel like maybe he's really good looking, though. Yeah, so does. Like, yeah, is that all I know about Tom Brady? <laughs> You're not wrong. Yeah, I could. I'll text my wife real quick, and she'll vouch for that for sure in a heartbeat. <laughs> She's gonna be like, "So, how's that CMO thing working out for you?" <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hey, you hey honey, do you player? think that Tom Brady is hot? <laughs> she one hundred percent text back. Uh, F F yeah. <laughs> and why? <laughs> like, why are you asking me? But shit, yes, he is. Um, <laughs> All right. Okay. Um, I know we're know? getting close to the end of our time. So I wanted to actually close us out here um, after the wonderful wins. So thank you for playing along. I appreciate Woo! it. That was um, really fun. <laughs> yes. Uh, I just wanted to see if we could close out with how I was inspired by you um, when you did your keynote at AppSec DC. If you could just lead us on a guided meditation or some breathing exercises, whichever yeah. you would like. Um, I figured it would be a good close to our time together and then head us off. Can I, can I put in the request for the audience to participate, if possible, yes. enjoy these last five minutes we have on the stream with Caroline leading us. 
So if you want, you can put your hands in this like lotus position. So you like go as if you're clapping and then you keep your thumb and your pinkies together, but then you like splay the rest. And then I will invite you to take three deep breaths. You might hear my three-year-old screaming in the background. That, that's really good for meditation. <laughs> yeah, it's really good for meditation. It keeps you in the moment. So what I think is important for each of us to know today is to know that you are important and to know that you are worthy and to know that your work has value. And to know that even though there are problems and challenges in the world, there are good people to work with and partner with. And we, as a human race, we are innovative, we are smart, we are agile and flexible, and we can do new things. And there's a lot of hope for the future. Uh, you can unsplay your fingers because mine are hurting right now. And uh, if you want to, like, grasp your hands like this and then put it, like, on your, like, sacrum and just kind of press, and then we're going to take three more breaths. <sighs> the screaming three-year-old is very cute. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Thank you. That was so wonderful. Thank you so much, Caroline. I appreciate you ending. joining us today. I, I really enjoyed the conversation. I think, you know, we've done a, we've, I think it's episode seven for us. We've done a bunch of uh, different discussions, different games and different topics. And this has been such a unique and wonderful conversation. Thank you so much for your time, Caroline. My pleasure. Thanks so much for All having right. me. And now, now comes the fun fart, fun part, fun fart. Get her off my show. <laughs> Thank oh, you, Caroline. After, after the guided meditation, that's how you want to send her off. Thanks. Exactly. After after the, all the <laughs> wonderful talk about, you know, culture and I just get her off my show. <laughs> Ashley, what do we have coming down the pipe for the for the show? What do we have? Do yeah. we have a do we have a, a two weeks out for the next episode? Is that correct? Yes. So our regularly scheduled uh, program, uh, for those of you who don't know, we are planning for the first and third Tuesdays of every month. So that should be fairly easy. That may mean that there are some weeks in between, but at least if you're looking at the week or at the month, is it the first or third Tuesday of the month? We're probably going live. We may have some specials here and there. So for example, there may be some special holidays or something like that, or uh, days that are noteworthy in the security world. And we may want to do a special for those days. So those will come and go as, as necessary, but uh, definitely tune in in two weeks uh, on February 1st. Um, is our next episode. Excellent. And so February 1st, next episode, we're running every two weeks. Um, I'm super excited about this. I think, uh, you know, the, uh, the bookshelf's coming along. The guest list is coming along. Our comments have hit a new, we have uh, comments that come in in real time. I try to answer them as necessary. Um, they're hit a new high. We hit a new high on concurrent visitors. I would love everyone. It helps us a ton. If you hit subscribe, hit follow, you know, tag everything, send out a tweet about the show. We would love it. We're just starting the show and it takes fans to help grow it. So please yep. tweet about us. Please let others know if you enjoyed the show. And yeah, thank you so much for tuning in to uh, Cyber Therapy. Thanks, Ash. Awesome. Thank you all.